I was wondering how easy it is for us to introduce the virus into our homes from such as the supermarket, packaging, etc. It's, um, it's capable of surviving on hard surfaces um, and on things like paper and cardboard um, for se several hours, sometimes even a couple of days. Now, it's thought that on absorb absorbent surfaces like paper and cardboard, it can live 24 hours or so. Um, and then again, on, on if you're buying tin cans uh, of food in the supermarket, it's possible that the, someone who's brought the food to the shop, to the supermarket, could have contaminated uh, the, um, the, the, the cans, the packages. Um, it's possible that the shelf stacker could have contaminated it, even the cashier handling it at the till. So in theory, the thing to do is when you get your, your shopping home or you get something uh, delivered by the postman through the door, just bear in mind that there's a small risk that the virus could be on the surface of those things. We know hard surfaces can harbour the virus for quite a bit longer, maybe up to three days. So that's oh, right. why it's good to disinfect um, uh, keyboards in offices where people share the work. It's important to wipe down door handles, do your cleaning with your bleach products at home in a normal way. With packaging, things like um, uh, anything in cardboard, take the, um, the goods out of the packaging, either throw the packaging away um, and wash your hands or store it overnight for 24 hours and you should be fine uh, if you've done that. Um, the same applies to paper in the post. With food, the t put the tin cans away. Uh, the virus will decay naturally after a period of time, maybe two or three days at most. And if you're washing your hands frequently, you're minimizing the already minimal risk. Um, my son works in a care home as a carer in the dementia wing. He had symptoms, he displayed symptoms two weeks ago. He um, self-isolated straight away. He then tested positive last Tuesday. So he self-isolated for another seven days. He wants to go back to work on Monday. Is it safe to say that he's virus free or would he need to be retested, please? If his symptoms have gone and uh, he's feeling better, mm -hmm. he's feeling completely better, after his seven days of self-isolation, mm -hmm. he should be absolutely fine to go back to work, um, even if he's got a dry cough still. Um, okay. we, know, we know that the cough can persist for some time, even when the virus is gone. So it's, it's thought that after the seven days, if he's feeling well, he's mm -hmm. okay to go back to work and that his, uh, uh, his patients, uh, the people that he's caring for, should be absolutely fine. Good, lovely. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. Fantastic job that he's doing for everybody. He so, is, he is. Well done. Yeah. Thank you. Thank bye bye. You. Is it possible that areas of the UK will not be peaking at the same time due to the time lag? Uh, if so, and if it is deemed that current restrictions are due to be relaxed at some point, wouldn't this pose a huge risk? the people in these areas that are behind the curve? It's a good question. What we know is that there are more cases in urban areas such as London um, and uh, cities in the Midlands than there are in rural areas. And, and that's why it's been described as some places lagging behind what we're seeing elsewhere. So we saw a lot of cases in London and then we began to see a few more cases around the rest of the country. Now. Here's the thing, we've all been in lockdown at the same time. The whole country nationally has been in lockdown for the last, uh, what, five, six weeks? Yeah. And therefore, we have reduced the transmission of the virus across the whole country at the same time. Yeah. So when and if we start to ease lockdown, people will be coming out of these restrictions bit by bit and so there's no risk of the, the viral virus being transmitted any more to those other regions than they are anywhere else. So it's a good question, but the, the, the time lag is no longer relevant because we've all been in lockdown at the same time. Ah, but of course, 
the virus will still be out there and we will still need to socially distance. That will still remain very important. Yeah. What's your question? Well, I had a heart attack in October last year, a STEMI heart attack. Um, it was treated very quickly. I had two stents put in. Um, I've done my cardio rehab. I feel absolutely fit as a fiddle. Um, I haven't had a letter from the NHS saying that I'm shielded, but I believe I'm in the high risk category. Um, I was just wondering if I can go out and look for like delivery jobs. Um, so there were two categories that were described uh, by the government's advisors. One was a vulnerable group and the other was the high risk group. You're certainly not in the high risk group because you're, you, you, you've got no immune suppression. You're not taking any medicines. You're not having chemotherapy. Um, you haven't got uh, you know, uh, an organ transplant uh, history. So you're not in the most at risk group. The vulnerable group constitutes people with heart disease, people with um, respiratory problems uh, such as chronic obstructive airways disease, we call uh, chronic bronchitis, um, emphysema, that sort of thing. Nor are you of a, a certain age uh, that makes you vulnerable, over 70. Now, you've had a heart attack and you've got stents. Now, in theory, after your uh, uh, cardiac rehabilitation, you should be as fit as a fiddle. This is, this is why almost certainly you haven't had a letter to, to say that you're in the vulnerable group. You've had your treatment and theoretically um, your coronary arteries are wide open, your heart muscles functioning well, uh, you've been rehabilitated um, and it's considered um, by your GP or your specialist that actually this doesn't any longer mean that you're in a vulnerable group. Um, so that's really good news. Um, and I think it's quite, you know, if you feel fit enough and you've done your rehab, that you can go back to, to doing the, the kind of job that you have in mind. Um, the people who have hay fever, are they like at higher risk of having severe symptoms of uh, coronavirus? No, uh, it's not thought that they are. Um, they're certainly not uh, placed in a vulnerable group or the at-risk group. Um, the, the immune response is quite high, if anything, uh, in people with hay fever because they're reacting to the pollen and they've got a, 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 a sort of uh, an exaggerated response with immunity. So uh, all the evidence uh, suggests that they're no more at risk than anybody else. Um, and uh, that's probably quite, quite good to know when you're suffering from symptoms already. Um, I think the other thing that I've been asked often is do the antihistamines um, in any way help or uh, uh, reduce my resistance to COVID-19 and they work in a completely different way to the immune response. They, they deal with the histamine which re is released by the body uh, in response to pollen. So um, th there's, there's no effect from anti taking antihistamines for hay fever in terms of COVID-19. of the UK population do you currently expect to have coronavirus or to have already had it and recovered? So this includes everyone, uh, so people at home who have uh, who have not been tested and have had it asymptomatically. And how far are we from reaching herd immunity? Well, um, if only we knew the answers to that, Abid, we'd be um, so far forward in what we know about coronavirus. It's impossible to know how many people um, have had COVID-19 because we just haven't done enough testing. It's impossible to know how many of those um, were asymptomatic, how many people who had it who were asymptomatic, how many people um, have it at home, until we get more testing. If all the population wore either face masks or face coverings outside, would that stop the spread of the COVID-19? And if not, why not? Well, the answer to that is we don't know because we've never done it. Um, if you look at countries where culturally and historically they wear face masks a lot of the time, it doesn't seem to reduce transmission of flu. 
um, and you'd expect it to. It's a respiratory virus, a bit like coronavirus, um, and the countries that have worn face masks um, because of pollution or because of fear of um, virus transmission, their transmission of flu-like viruses is exactly the same as anywhere else in the world. So it, it doesn't seem logical that just wearing a face mask in the open um, when you go out you know, and, and you're, you're doing your normal activities doesn't seem that there's a strong, any, any kind of strong evidence at all that it would help to reduce transmission.